Today I'm gonna to talk about the simplicity of the gospel. This is so foundational, this is so doctrine, this is doctrinal, and this is um, the simplicity of the gospel. And this is a house, you know, sometimes we can get some heavy rev, heavy revelation, some, some real steak and, and uh, meat and potatoes, and, and we have to have that, but there needs to be the doctrine given in the, in the church so that we are reminded of the simplicity of the truth of our salvation. How many know salvation is not ever intended to be complicated? Jesus is not complicated. And I want today to preach on the simplicity. This is some real foundational stuff here in uh, Genesis 15 verses one through six, and then in Romans chapter four verses one through six. Uh, And when they have that in the back, if you'll put that on the screen, I want us to read it together. Genesis chapter 15 verse one reads like this. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, uh, that's not the right chapter, sorry, 15. Y'all, yeah, that's my bad. I said 16, but the Lord knows my heart. Genesis 15 verses 1. I promise you it is the right one. Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, after these things, <laughs> let's do this together, Lord. It'd be better if you help me, Jesus. Um, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. Come on, read with me. I am your shield. You're exceedingly, keep going. Keep going in the back. Verse two, let's roll. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Verse three. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Verse four. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Verse five. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Verse six. And he believed in the Lord. I want you to read that line again. And he believed in the Lord, and he, God, accounted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. Now flip over to Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four, let's read this together. Romans chapter four, verse number one. Is it on the screen? Let's read. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? Verse two, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse three, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. Say that with me again. Abraham believed, one more time. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, verse four. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace. One translation said as a gift, but as a debt, verse five. But to him who does not work, but what? But what? Does what? On him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Two places it says Abraham believed God and because he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. God literally called Abraham righteous because he simply believed. And I wanna preach a message today. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, whatever you do, don't stop believing. Come on, Journey. You 80s people need to get saved. I see you wanting to move your hips and whatnot. Calm down, it's the house of God. Don't stop believing. Look at your other neighbor one more time. Tell them, don't stop believing. Y'all need to repent, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together in your word. Give me grace to preach, give them grace to receive. Let the word and faith collide in this room and let our lives be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, the family said, Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let me teach some this morning on the doctrine of our salvation. 
and, um, and, and this whole issue of faith. Everybody say faith. We know that according to Hebrews 12, faith is a substance, 11, faith, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, elders obtained a good report. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Consider those two phrases. They sound like an oxymoron. How can you have the substance of something you're still hoping for? How can you have evidence and it not be seen? Evidence by nature means something you see. But faith is able to not actually have tangibility, but it be done because you believe the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord you put your belief and your faith in is so sure, even if you don't see it, you're able to believe for it because you know God cannot lie. This text before us today in Romans chapter four, let, let's talk briefly about Romans. Romans is a book written by Paul to a church he had never visited. In fact, he wanted to go visit Rome but was unable to visit Rome. And we know that this book of Romans, uh, at least we have pretty good reason to believe the book of Romans was not yet written, uh, or, or pardon me, it was written before, I should say, the, um, the, 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 the uprising against the church. You remember under Nero, who was uh, a leader in the Roman government. Um, you understand that Nero hated the Christians and wanted to destroy Christianity. And so he, he, he put out this, just this horrible attack against Christians. And we know that Romans was written before that. So it was written before Paul was able to get to the church. It was written before the persecution really got strong against the church. And so he's writing to a church. And this is a church that is literally, their existence is right in the center of hell's kitchen. The Roman, the Roman government, the Roman culture it was just a way of life. It was a, a very difficult atmosphere for Christians to live in. And, and he writes to the church at Rome and somewhere around 58 AD, he writes this letter to them and Rome, Romans, the book of Romans is probably his crown jewel. It is where we get what many theologians call systematic theology. And systematic theology is an understandable way of learning Christianity, line upon line, precept upon precept, where you begin to see the principles of God, the truth of God, and it unfolds in a way that it helps make sense so that you and I can discover truth for our journey. And I value revelation, and I value the spirit of wisdom and revelation. How many know we need, we need revelation? But I'm so concerned sometimes people are getting so deep that they don't even know basic truth. And I want you to know right now, you not only need to know deep things, you need to know truthful things. And, and I don't even want to say practical, I'm just talking about application, stuff that you can, actually, you can actually employ and work in your own personal life and see the results of it. And that is found in the book of Romans. There's a lot about our Christian living. There's a lot about um, the word of the Lord. There's a lot about what faith is. There's a lot about... Uh, there's a lot of big words in Romans like justification and sanctification and glorification and salvation. What do all those things mean? We get that from the book of Romans. When Paul comes to the book of Romans, it's important that you understand what his agenda is in writing the book of Romans. The book of Romans is written by the hand of Paul, number one, to indict all of humanity as guilty of being sinful. If you read chapter one and chapter two, some very dark passages of scripture, some heavy stuff. I'm not just, I'm not, I, you can read it. You can find it for yourself. It's there. When, he, when you read Romans chapter one and Romans chapter two, Paul is saying stuff like, uh, he's talking about how deep into sin humanity has gotten. He's talking about how deep into darkness humanity has plunged. And there's a reason why he takes two, two chapters to talk about the condition of humanity. He wants all of humanity to know you are separated from God because of sin. Sin. We don't like talking about sin in the church anymore. People get offended when you talk about sin. People want to act like there is no such thing as sin. But sin is something that everyone in this room, no matter where you come from, no matter how much money you have in the bank, no matter the color of our skin, no matter who our mother and father were, I want to tell you, all of us were born short of the glory of God. All of us were born sinners. No one in this room, I don't care how many tongues they talk in, how many gifts they have, how many titles they possess in the kingdom, nobody was born that way. 
when you and I were born in this world, we were born into sin. We came through the womb of our precious mother and even our precious mother was tainted with the sin and her DNA of our foreparents, Adam and Eve. Everyone who ever drew a breath on planet earth was born a sinner. I hear people all the time argue, um, they wanna argue was, was uh, a, a person born a particular way. Let, let, me, let me help you understand something. All of us were born a particular way. I don't care how, what you were inclined to do when you were born in the flesh, whether your inclination was, was lying, whether your inclination was cheating, whether your inclination was heterosexual sin, whether your inclination was homosexual sin, does it really matter what we were inclined or, 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 or bent toward? We get real specific and we hate on people who have a different sin category that they struggle with other than ours. But the reality of it is all of us had sin of some sort in our DNA. I don't stand up here and bash people who have a different sin struggle than I do. We all struggle with it because we were all born from people. All of us were born from people who struggled with it and their forefathers did and their foreparents did all the way back to Adam and Eve. Everything Adam opened up um, this world to through his sin, it got transmitted through the DNA transmission, which is why Paul says in the book of Corinthians that if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. You've actually been regened. Oh, if I had time. I said, oh, if I had time. You have been regenerated. That's what regeneration is. Watch this. When you got born again, you literally become a different species of people. The devil don't know what to do with you either. So you've been born again. Say, I've been born again. If you're saved, you've been born again. And so, so Paul takes the first two chapters of the book of Romans to indict humanity as being sinful. He gets to the third chapter, he introduces a concept about, uh, that, that, that we should get really excited about, and that is grace. And he talks about the manifestation of this grace in the life of a particular man. His name is Abram. Now, this is beautiful because he has indicted, for two chapters, he has told humanity how messed up and sinful they are, and now he's about to start pulling humanity out of the pit she's in, and the only way out of the pit of sin and the downward spiral of sin that we were all on, the only way out of it is through a person named Jesus Christ. And so Paul comes to this fourth chapter, and I want to briefly give you these three things. I want to talk to you about the, I want to talk to you about the, um, the, the example of tr- of of trusting God, which is Abraham. I wanna talk to you about the explanation of trusting God, which is what real faith is. And then I wanna talk to you about the experience of trusting God. What does that mean, the outcome of it in our life? Number one, the example. Abraham is the example of faith. God goes to a dude who doesn't know him and he says to Abram, leave your father, follow me, and I'll take you to a place and I'll bless you. And Abraham's like, sure, you got it. And he loads up the truck like the clampets. He just loads up the trunk and he moves and he goes to a city according to Hebrews chapter 11. He starts looking for a city whose building and maker is God who have foundations that were not made by man. Abraham, where are you going? I don't know, but I'll know when I get there. How will you know when you get there? Because God's gonna show me this place. He promised me a land and you know that story. He leaves his home, he leaves his father and he goes looking for this land. And in his 75th year of living, God comes to Abram in the 15th chapter, I read it to you, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, God comes to Abram and he says, I'm gonna make you a father of many nations and I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna blow your mind with the offspring that I give you and, and I'm gonna do it through you. And Abram says, wait a minute, I have a, I have a servant in my house whose name is Eliezer, he's from Damascus, will he be the heir? And God said, that will not be the heir. Guys, can we have this conversation real quick? Abraham is 75 when God tells him he's gonna have a son. Like if you go to that church and people start prophesying to a 75-year-old, you're getting ready to have a child, I'm not going back to that church. I mean, y'all do what you wanna do. I've got six children. I'm telling you right now, at 75, I don't want number seven. Come on, somebody, talk to me. I love my babies, but at 75, I wanna fish. You hear what I'm saying? Okay, so at 75, he says you're gonna have a son. Sarah hears God talking to him and Sarah laughs and God says, that's okay, I'll have the last laugh and she actually named her son laughter when she had him. Don't laugh at God, God will get the last laugh every time, right? So Abram, he believes, watch this, the sixth verse of the 15th chapter of 
of Genesis, God tells Abram at 75 years old, you're gonna have a son. And Abram believed God. It just says that. Abram believed God. God told Abram, I'm gonna do something in your life. And Abram said, I'll believe, I trust you. I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about that for a moment because we need to talk about what this believing God means. This is not some mindless mental ascent of believing in a God. When it says he believed God, it actually doesn't say he believed God. Look at your Bible, it says he believed the Lord. The Lord is the covenant name for Yahweh in the Bible. Do you pick up on what I'm talking about? When it says he believed God, this was not some mysterious, uh, ethereal being out in some far removed corner of the universe. When it says Abraham believed the Lord, there's this sense of getting to know him and trusting the God he is getting to know. I want you to understand today when we say we're going to believe God, the example we have is Abram and Abram shows us that believing God is not just some mindless sort of mental ascent of believing in a God, but it is believing in the God of the Bible. There's a lot of people following gods today. It's not the God of the Bible. In fact, there are some circles when I get in and start talking theology, I qualify what I'm saying and I say something like this, the God of the Bible. (laughs) Why do you do that? Because there are people now who associate their crazy God with the God of the Bible. I wanna tell you right now, God gets blamed and and a lot of gets attributed to God that he had nothing to do with. And we need to get this stuff square in our minds and in our hearts that the God of the Bible is very different than the God of this world. He's very different than the God of religion. He's very different than even the God of of some things that call themselves Christianity. And we've got to make sure that when we raise our children and we teach them God, we don't just teach them about a God. We teach the God of the Bible who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, 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 and so Abraham becomes our example. God tells him, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And Abraham says, how can this be? I'm an old man, I'm 75 years old. And God says, that, that son that you're raising, that servant you're raising in your house is not the one. And, he's, and, and I can see the look on Abraham's face. Okay, so what is, where is the one coming? If, if this is not my son through whom you will accomplish all these promises, then how are you gonna do this? And God says, for that, you gotta step outside the tent and I gotta show you the sky. So he steps outside the tent and he says, Abram, look up, do you see the stars? Can you count them? Are you able? Because as numerous as the stars and the heavens are, that's how many sons and daughters you will have in your family. Can you imagine being 75 years old and God showing you a family that big and him knowing at 75 somehow this broke down body That is not what it used to be. Come on, somebody. God is going to fulfill his promise. I want to tell somebody in here right now, God is never too late to fulfill what he promised over your life. And I know we do a lot of talking to sons and daughters, but let let me talk to Mamma and Papa for a minute. Let me talk to Grandma and Grandpa for a minute. You may be feeling like you're rounding third coming home and that you're on your last leg and you've got some promises that are outstanding. You've got some prophecies that haven't yet come to pass. I want to tell you right now, before you buy a plot in the graveyard, before they take you to the funeral home and they and they eulogize your life and celebrate who you were you are going to see god papa you are going to see god do exactly i got a grandmama standing up pointing at me right now i wish i could find me about five senior citizens who believe that god ain't through yet and it doesn't matter how tired and weary I feel. It don't matter how old and how, how outdated I'm told I am sometimes. I may be a dinosaur and I may be outdated, but I still got a promise that I'm holding on to. And God is going to finish what he started and do what he promised in my life. He believed God. Watch this. Abraham believed God. He believed the promise and, he, and God saw his faith and called him righteous. I want to talk to you about that for a moment. That blows my mind. That God made Abraham a promise and Abraham believed God's word and God said, oh, I found somebody who trusts me. I'm going to make him righteous. 
I'm not going to let him work to get it either. I'm just looking for somebody who trusted my plan. There is something powerful about, it's the first time in the Bible faith and righteousness are found in the same conversation as right here in Romans chapter four. Faith and righteousness are in Genesis 15 and in Romans chapter four. And by the way, let me tell you this, you need to underline Genesis 15 verse six in your Bible. It is mentioned four times in the New Testament, that one verse. That one verse is found four times, three times in the Pauline epistles and once in the epistle of James, the third chapter. Four times in the New Testament, that, that one verse from Genesis 15 is mentioned in the New Testament from the Old Testament, and that is significant. Anything, anytime you see something mentioned four times from the Old Testament in the New Testament, you need to write it down and memorize it because what God is trying to show us is that scripture that was first found in the Old Testament has influence on the foundation of our faith that we discover in the grace covenant of the new covenant in the, in the New Testament. And so this is foundational and formational for our faith. This verse used four times in the New Testament, God is trying to get us to see something. And here's what he wants us to see, that Abraham is trying to show us an example that becoming righteous is not something he had a whole lot to do with. I'm not gonna get any help in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. I'm not gonna get a whole lot of help today because we were raised to think this way. The more I do and the better I am, the more righteous I become. The more I do and the better I am, the more righteous I become. Can I tell you something that's getting ready to freak you out? You who are in Christ, I said this in Cleveland, I felt the air leave the room and I predict it's gonna happen the same way here. You who are in Christ are as righteous as Christ himself. <sighs> you say, I do not believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. Because when we became righteous, it wasn't our righteousness that he gave us. It was actually the righteousness of Christ that he gave us as a free gift. It is the reason why I can say I am as righteous in the sight of God as Jesus. Are you saying you're Jesus? Not, not even close. I'm saying what I have is a gift from him. And who I am is because he lives in me. And when God sees me, God doesn't see my performance. God sees the perfect son and the perfect son and his righteousness have been attributed to my account. Any other righteousness is filthy rags. When you preach this, you collide with decades of formation and decades of teaching and training in a church where we told people, if you fall down, you're no longer righteous. If you screw up, you weren't righteous. If you mess up, you're not righteous and you better work hard to get righteous again. I wanna tell you what the Bible says. The Bible said a just man falls down seven times, but he gets back up again. The definition of victory is never falling. The the definition of victory is getting up one more time than you fell down. If you've fallen down and made a mess, we're not here to step on you. We're here to throw a hand out to you and say, do you still, I'm not interested in what you did. I want to know what you believe and who you're trusting. Because if you still believe and trust Jesus, righteousness is a gift. You, if it, okay, so let's go to Romans uh, 4 again. Let's just teach here. We're talking. I'm trying to calm down. Um, he says, I think it's that third verse. We are Chad. I think it's that first verse where he says, if you work for it, it's a wage. Now, the only time I read about wages in the Bible was in a negative sense. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Listen to me, don't miss what I'm getting ready to say. You actually, Jesus made this so good, you actually have to work for death. The wages, what is a wage? A wage is what you work for. You actually have to mess this up real bad to miss it. You actually work your way into death, but you believe your way into life. It never starts with 
this is what you ought to do so you can become a Christian. It always starts with, do you trust God? Do you believe God? If you get the believing right, then the doing right follows freely. Let's take it a step deeper. Because if Abraham is our example of experience, so we talk about the, the, the expression, the, ex, the, the explanation of faith. But if Abraham is the example of faith, I had this question this week as I pondered on this text. What did Abraham believe? It said Abraham believed God. Okay, so what did he, exactly he believe? Because believing has to do with a word. Believing has to do with something you show us. So if you show me or you tell me you're gonna do something, if I trust you, then I can walk away even though you haven't done it yet. I can walk away and say, his word is so good with me that even though I haven't seen it, even though I haven't seen it, I'm gonna walk away and know he did it already. Even if it hadn't happened yet. That's true faith, family. When God makes you a promise and you don't have to keep sweating it, I don't know if anybody else ever struggles with faith like this, but sometimes I struggle with feeling like I'm being presumptuous when I have faith. Like there must be something more to it. I got to like sweat some. I got to get into this. Like I need to roll on the floor. I need to show that I'm in some kind of turmoil. That's all religious garbage. Do you understand God just seriously wants you to walk up and get a promise and be like, thank you, Father. I received that glory to God. Tomorrow, next week, next year, a decade from now, however you do it, whenever you do it, if you said it, you are not a man that you should lie, I'm gonna believe your word. And God elbows the angels and you say, y'all see that? That's called faith. And because he believes me, I call him righteous. Abraham, what did he believe? He believed God's word. But I'm gonna tell you what else he believed. Abraham believed in Christ. I'm getting ready to blow minds right here. Abraham believed in Jesus. I'm letting it soak. Well, how can that be? Abraham was thousands of years before Jesus. And because Abraham was thousands of years before Jesus, there's no way Abraham could have believed in Jesus. That's because you forgot what John chapter eight said. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He looked at the Pharisees and said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. What? Abraham was 2,000 years before Jesus and he saw Jesus? How did he see Jesus? Have you forgotten what happened in Genesis chapter 21 when he was on his way up a mountain and the Bible says on the third day he saw that place afar off? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What place did he see? He saw into the future while he was taking Isaac, his son, up on a mountain to give him to God. He saw something on the third day which I don't have time to preach on the third day. But on the third day, he saw a hill out in the distance and God revealed to Abraham a day that was coming when God himself would give his son as the Messiah, the Lamb of God, to be slain. I believe that is why Abraham kept walking up the mountain with his son. And when his son said, Daddy, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where is the lamb? And Abraham said, Son, don't sweat it. God shall provide himself a lamb. I already got a word on this. I already see where this is going. I want somebody to understand right now that when Abraham saw that place, he knew what God was up to, which is why he was willing to put Isaac on an altar because he understood Isaac will never be the sacrifice. I saw the sacrifice. I know there's a man coming, which is why Jesus said in John 8 that Abraham saw my day. Jesus said Abraham saw the day I was coming. Watch. And he rejoiced. Why would Abraham rejoice? Because my son doesn't have to die. God's gonna send his son to die. My son is gonna live. I want you to know right now you can trust God and you can trust that God's plan is the only way. Jesus is not one among many. He is not a topping on the ice cream of religion. Jesus said, I am the way. Oh, Lord, I feel like preaching. I am the truth and I am the life. 
Can you say amen? I need to calm down. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we got to get this thing right about righteousness and faith. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved because we trust that God is who he said he is. He did what he said he would do. He is doing what he said he would do. He will do what he said he will do. Is, was, is to come. I felt like I read that somewhere in Revelation. He's the God who was, is, is to come. I am not interested in what you were trusting 20 years ago. Because if you're not trusting him now, you can't have peace. You've got to make sure that this trust and believing God is an ongoing relationship with a God you can know. Now, go to Romans 4. Let me wrap this up. So the example of our faith is Abraham. He heard the word of the Lord and believed it. He saw the day coming where Christ would be given and he believed. All right? When we say believe, the expression of believing is not just some mindless, I believe in God. There are people sitting in this room and listening to me online today, hear me in love as your pastor tell you this. Believing in God does not save your life. The angel, pardon me, the demons believe. I believe in God. I'm not asking you if you believe in God. I'm asking you this. Are you trusting him and walking with him in intimate fellowship? Do you trust him? Do you believe him? Is his word good with you? Is he faithful? Do you call him good? That's the kind of believing we're talking about. And we need to qualify that because some people believe in God on Easter. Oh Lord, grab the kids. Some people believe in God on Christmas. Some people believe in God in a crisis. Some people don't even go pray and talk to God till hell breaks loose, which is why hell breaking loose is a gift to you. Because some of you wouldn't have sought him till hell broke loose, broke loose. And if hell wouldn't have broke loose, you'd have kept on smoking and drinking and snorting and y'all don't want me to come down the list. You know what I'm talking about. But you let something crazy happen, honey, you will find out real quick how much you love God and hate the world. So trouble was a gift to some people, but you don't, listen to me, it's not intended to be that way. Believing God is this sense of walking with God. Do you understand Abraham talked face to face with God like a man talks to a friend? Like Abraham had conversation with God. Who else in the Bible has the kind of talk with God where God's about to destroy an entire city and Abraham looks at him and says, if I find 50, will you spare the city? Hey now, come now, you're the boy, you're the boy, you're the boy. You're the boy. Do you have a 40, do I have 40, 45, do I have 45, do I have 30, 30, 30. He has this talk with God. Like, I'm like, man, I would be scared to death. God would strike me dead. Abraham is like, are you for real going to kill the righteous with the wicked? That's what he says to God. But there's a reason why intercession is connected to friendship. I'm gonna preach on this one day. Intercession is connected to being a friend of God. This is not some transaction with a cosmic being and I'm some little robot begging a God. Oh no, he woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. I talked to him while I drank my coffee and I ate my pastry this morning. Are you hearing me? We talked about this message on my way to church. I'm not just talking about a God. I am in fellowship with the God of the universe. And when you've got that kind of fellowship and friendship with God and your children get in a mess, you don't walk to him and say, oh, what is the right word? You say, hey, 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 I talked to you this morning. I don't know if you know what's going on, but I need some help here. I need some intervention here. I'm trusting. Oh, God, I feel this. I'm believing you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? 
That's why Jesus said when you get ready to pray, don't bring all your religious garbage in there. I know what you need before you even ask me. Get to the point. Tell me what you need from me. Oh. Do you believe God? Do you trust God? Oh God, here we go. Do you trust him? Were your children? Do you trust him with your marriage? Do you trust him? Oh, here we go. Do you trust him with your finances? Well, I trust God. Not if you don't give to him, you don't. I'm not making nobody mad. I'm, I hope I'm still your pastor next Sunday. I'm not trying to make you mad at me. I want to tell you right now, these people who have spawned this new theology that I'm in grace and I don't have to give to God unless I want to, that's the craziest nonsense I've ever heard in my life. You don't tell anybody else who demands a payment, I don't feel like giving to you because I'm in grace. American Express wants your payment. The light bill wants your payment. The water bill wants your payment. I dare you to run to Publix today after church, grab some green beans and pineapples and rich crackers, get some little Debbie's, throw it up on there, try to pay for it, look at them and tell them, I ain't paying for this, I'm in grace. Do you understand? That doesn't work. Do you wanna know why? Because you cannot tell me you love God and God doesn't have access to everything you have. Where a man's treasure is, there his heart is also. If I trust God, I have no problem taking and giving him back what he gave me because if I ever give it to him, he'll put it back in my life. Good measure, press down, shake it together, run it over. I, I'm calming down. Okay, hear me. Trusting God is not just some mindless thing. It's not even something you do on Sunday morning at this hour. This is a relationship. Now watch this. So the example is Abraham. The expression of believing God is believing what he says. Believing he is who he said he is. And when you believe that, when you believe the gospel, when you believe Christ is sufficient, when you believe Christ is enough, when you believe Jesus paid it all, when you believe he is the only way, the truth, and the life, there are not multiple ways to God. When you believe he is, then God looks at your life and says, that's righteous. Righteous. I am in right standing before God. I am in Christ. When I am in Christ, I didn't work for that. It wasn't a wage I earned. It was a gift I received, which explains why some people in the church are so miserable. They are working for something Jesus is just trying to give them. And they're fighting with God, frustrated by religion, trying to be, oh, don't miss this. They're trying to become what he already said they are. Some of you are so condemned right now because you were raised in an environment that told you how horrible and dejected and how big of a failure you were. And you know what that, that environment was for some of you? Church. It would have been a whole lot easier to fix these problems if you got it on the street. But the street is more compassionate than the church many times. That's good preaching, Pastor. That's good preaching. The church is not always the most compassionate place for people who have fallen down. And when you believe right, God says you're righteous. You're not sort of saved, you're not sort of righteous. You're righteous, I'm closing with this. The last thing is found, now watch this. What does this mean? What does this mean that God calls me righteous when I believe him and I believe in his Christ and I believe in his finished work? the finished work of Jesus. When I believe this and I believe the gospel, what does this mean for me? What is the experience? We talked about the example. We talked about the expression of faith, the example of faith, Abraham. But what is the experience that I am to expect of living a life of faith? For that, you gotta go to the fifth chapter of Romans and I'm done with these few scriptures. Watch this. Therefore, having been justified, this is verse one, having been justified by what? 
Can we put Romans 5.1 up, please? Romans 5.1 for all the tech people who have a, uh, didn't bring a written Bible. They, they were hoping you put it on the screen. So they're gonna bring a written Bible next one, Sunday. Praise the Lord, you're gonna get points if you do that too. We'll give you some points and let you get a prize, okay? Look at this. <laughs> Vacation Bible School. Therefore, having been what? Justified by what? What is faith? Believing God, trusting the Lord. Don't overcomplicate it. Down in your heart, do you trust and believe God? If you do, if you trust and believe God, if you trust and believe his word, if you trust and believe his good news, his gospel, you're justified. Now let me teach you a simple way to learn justification because justification is a big word and some of y'all have heard this and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence but remember this. Justified means just as if I had never sinned. Just if I'd, just if I'd never done it. You did do it. We're not here to debate if you did it. You did it, which is why Jesus had to go to the cross. But him going to the cross provided atonement and forgiveness for sins. When God looks at you, he doesn't treat you according to what you did. He treats you according to the sacrifice Christ gave you and I. And when we trust that sacrifice, God does not treat us according to our sins. <laughs> Justified by faith. Let me tell you what he did not say. He did not say you were sanctified the moment you got saved. Okay, now oh, here we go now, uh-oh. We're getting ready to open up a can right here. He did not say you were sanctified because sanctification is something that happens all the way throughout your life. Sanctified is when my behavior becomes more and more like Jesus. Righteousness and justification is not my behavior, it's about my being. I am righteous. I am justified, which is one way of saying it this way. You cannot get more saved than saved. Have you ever been in one of them places and people look at you with their halo crooked, you know? And they say, you're sort of saved. There's no sort of saved. You're kind of saved. There's no kind of saved. Well, we're waiting to see if you pan out. Well, you know what? We're waiting to see if you pan out. Justification happens instantaneously. Sanctification happens every day of your life. And sanctification is the will of God for every one of us according to 1 Thessalonians. It's the, it's the will of God, even the sanctification of your soul. So you and I have to be sanctified ongoingly. We are not getting justified ongoingly. We were justified the moment we believed God. He called you and I righteous at that moment. Well, I don't feel righteous. God's good, ain't he? He'll call you what you can't call yourself. In fact, he'll call you the finished product before the product ever really gets started. He will look at you and say, I know this is day one of your Christian journey. The moment you got saved, on day one of your Christian journey, you were as righteous then as you are right now. I know some religious people cannot handle that, but that's the truth of the gospel. You were as righteous that day as you are today. You don't get more righteous than righteous. He calls you pure because of Christ. And when you believe that, he puts Christ's righteousness on your account. Can somebody praise the Lord for that? Now watch this. Done here. So therefore, since we've been justified by faith, so we believe God, and when we believe God, it releases several things in our experience. Number one, Peace with God. Some people in this room don't have peace with God because you haven't trusted God. If you begin to trust God, you will have peace with God because when you trust in God's perfect plan, it releases you from the feelings of shame, condemnation, and guilt. If you have no shame, condemnation, and guilt, then who can lay a charge against God's elect? There is nobody with a spiritual charge or any spiritual evidence that would call you guilty if Jesus says you are free. 
So there's peace with God. I don't have to lay down at night being tormented by feelings of torment, shame, and condemnation. There is no shame, torment, or condemnation. Yeah, but you don't know what I did 15 years ago. I have no clue, but I know what he did 2,000 years ago was greater than what you did 10 years ago. So hey, Anna, like Elsa said, let it go. Let it go. You have peace, say I have peace with God. Number two, not only do you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse two, go to that next verse for me if you can. You have access by this believing in God, trusting in God, you have access to what? Grace. This is bananas. Grace is unmerited favor that you don't get by earning it. How do you get it? By what? Faith, just believing God. Trusting God. I hope a, like a light is going on for somebody today. Yeah, but am I working hard enough? That's not the question. I'm asking you, what are you believing right now? We take a temperature on our spirituality by looking at our doing and not by what we're believing. Make sure you're believing right because if you're believing right, the doing will follow the believing. Yeah. And this is amazing to me that God actually gives access. He opens a door to those who believe. He opens a door for you to go into a room full of grace and find a life that is full of unmerited favor. Like, listen to me very carefully. You're going to have encounters and experiences in life as you follow Jesus where he's gonna blow your mind. And you're gonna walk out of places going, how did that just happen? You walked into the room believing and trusting God. You walked out of the room and you weren't even qualified for the job, but they gave you the job because grace got on you and they don't even know what grace is, but they like you so much and really it ain't even just you they like, it's the God in you and the grace on you and the favor that's resting there. And they say, wait a minute, I just want them to be in my office because there's something like joy or peace or some good is on them. I just want them, or I just really believe this. If you got God in you, people will hire you just because the atmosphere shifts when you walk into the room. And it's not even you, it's the grace on you. Finally, third, and, no, go back, I'm sorry, go back, go back, go back, go back, and rejoice. So you have access by faith, you have peace with God by faith, and you're able to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means sitting here today, as crazy as our life is, we have a hope that one day we are going to be glorified with him. Glorification is happening to you in your future. You, I'm gonna freak you out. You're actually going to be glorified. I'm not saying that, the Bible says that in the book of Romans. Glorification is coming to the people of God. That means we're going to be made perfected in his image. And so what's the, res what's the result of that family? We rejoice. Right. Tribulation, next verse, tribulation, tribulation. What about tribulation? We'd rejoice. Because tribulation's even working for our good. Oh my God, I better quit because the chicken's getting cold and the tacos are drying up. But I want to tell you right now that if you catch this, your Mondays that feel miserable will become fuel for greater victory. When you go through a trouble, a tribulation, a trial, you don't get further and further away from him. That tribulation becomes an invitation into a place of intimacy where you share in his suffering. And when you share in his suffering, you don't suffer alone. You don't walk through it alone. You don't go through struggles alone. He's right there with you. And there's a moment in your journey when every struggle and trial and tribulation pales in comparison to the revelation of his goodness and his glory and his love for you. That's why Paul could say, shall nakedness or peril, shall sword, shall famine, shall a demonic principality, can anything separate me from the love of God? Nay, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor thing present, nor thing to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I hope every demonic spirit that's been tormenting
telling you, here's what I just preached. You are loved by God. You're not going to be loved. You are loved. And nothing can separate you from this love. Stand with me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're in this room and you want to get to know this Jesus, I'm not talking about know about him. I'm talking about you want to trust him, that he is who he said he is, that he'll do what he said he'll do, that his word is sure, his plans for you are perfect, and his plan of redemption includes you. And you don't want to reject the invitation he's giving today. I don't know if you've heard of Jesus or never heard of Jesus. I don't know if you've been to church or if this is your first time ever coming to church. All of it's irrelevant. If you're in this room, you would say, Bishop, I need you to pray for me. I wanna get right with God. I just wanna believe. I wanna trust him. Listen, with a mouth, with a heart man believes, and with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's what Romans says. You believe in your heart and it becomes a confession of your mouth and God saves you. He calls you righteous. If you're in this room and you need his righteousness in your life, shh, what a gift. If you need to be justified, just as if I'd never done it before, if you want your past to be forgiven and your sins to be washed away. When I say three, just throw your hand up and say, Pastor Kev, would you pray for me? I want to get right with God. One, two, three, right now. Lift your hand. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. I see your hand. God bless you, sir. God bless you back there. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Everybody look at me. There's some hands up in this house. How many know this is a good Sunday? I said, how many know this is a good Sunday? I want you to look at your neighbor. Here, listen to me carefully. There's a person on your left and a person on your right. You may have met them 10 years ago. You may have known them your whole life, but you may have never met them before today. I don't know how well you know your neighbor, but I want you to help your neighbor, and here's how. I want you to look over at your neighbor on your left and right and say, do you need someone to go to the altar and pray with you? And if you lifted your hand, or you should have, when your neighbor asks you, if you need to come to the altar, come out of your seat and come stand with me right now. There is room at the cross for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. There is room at the cross for you. Though millions have come. God bless you. They're still coming. There is room. God bless you, son. Come on over here, son. Come over here, sweetheart. Come on. They're coming down aisles. I need some saints to praise the Lord here. There is room at the cross for you. Stretch your hands toward our new family and pray for them like you wish somebody would have prayed for you the day you gave your life to Christ. And our prayer leaders, and these precious family of ours here at our church are loving these people into the kingdom of God and lives are being changed. But just stretch your hands toward them and just put a canopy of prayer over their life right now. Father, I just thank you for what you're doing in the lives of these sons and daughters, these men and women who've come. I thank you that no one's too far gone. Thank you that no one's too deep in sin. No one, Lord, is too beyond hope. Today, Lord, let them trust and obey. I pray, Lord, that today, as the gospel has been presented, they would believe in Christ. Glory! They would believe in Christ and the free gift of righteousness would be given to them today. We thank you for it. In the name of, come on, just a few more seconds of praying for them. Father, I speak strength over their faith, peace over their hearts and minds. Keep them in all their ways. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it today. We thank you for the power of your cross today, Lord. Oh, can we just worship him, church, just for a moment before we leave? Can we just lift our hands and thank God for our salvation today? Come on, if you're thankful. Not just, you can clap if you want to. I want you to clap. But can we lift our hands and lift our voice with some adoration to the king? Can we just give him glory and praise because of what he's done in our life? Oh, we give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you praises. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
hallelujah. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Thank you, precious Jesus. Thank you. Come on, one more time before we go home. At the cross, at the cross. At the burden of my heart. It was there by faith. I received my sight. I want you to lift your hands in a receiving position. Let me pray a blessing over the family today. Father, this week, I pray you will give them ordered steps, divine appointment. I pray for divine provision and blessing for them and their families. I pray in all their ways you would keep them, Lord. I pray that every turn would be guided by your hand and may you get the glory for everything done in their life this week. I speak blessing over them and their children. I speak blessing over their jobs, their careers, their finances. I pray this week you would provide. Jesus, we believe that you're good and we trust that you're taking care of your people. Now go before us and surround us and keep us in all of our ways this week. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name and the family is blessed and said amen and amen. God bless you, we love you. Be careful, go in the peace and the joy of the Lord.